just want to thank you all this morning for the opportunity to come and share the word with you. It's always a blessing uh, to gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ and to just look at God's word and say, Lord, what do you have for us today? And every time we go to the word of God, it speaks to us. It's living, it's powerful. And so I trust that as we listen to the word of God, our hearts would be sensitive to what he would have for us this morning. And so this morning I thought I would consider Psalm 19 with you. The book of Psalms is unique in a number of ways. I think you figure you've got this giant hymnal right in the middle of your Bibles. And we know that it's a hymnal. And as you go through it, you find that there are hymns of praise where they're just simply praising the Lord. For example, praise the Lord. This is Psalm 135. One. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. O servants of the Lord. There's hymns of lament when they're feeling like they need the Lord and they're sorrowful. Psalm 22, 1 is quoted, and the Lord Jesus said these very words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's found in the Psalms. They're crying out to God. Another one is the hymns of petition, where they go before the Lord and they ask the Lord through a song for something. In, in Psalm 16, verse 1, it says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. This is a little loud for me. This is a little just give you a heads up on it, thanks, because I, if I raise my voice, I hate to interrupt this, but I just, it keeps coming back at me, thank you. Uh, so it's hymns of petition. Then, then the Psalms, another thing that they do is the Psalms instruct. In Psalm 119, verse 71, listen to what this says. It was good for me to be afflicted. Now, I don't know how many of you would say that, but yet the psalmist says this. He says, it was good for me to be afflicted. And so our next question is, why would he say something like that? And in the rest of the verse, he says so, that I might learn your decrees. And so we even here, the psalmist is praying to the Lord. He's instructed and saying, the stuff, the difficulty things, the difficult things I go through are there so that God might teach me his word. And the psalms also bring great encouragement. I think of Psalm 116, verses 5 and 6. It says this, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. There's perhaps no other book in Scripture that touches all of our different emotions that way. And all of the Psalms, when you begin to look at them, all of them direct our attention to the Lord. One of the things you read about Psalms is when you're reading through the Psalms, you cannot help but think about the Lord. But then also, not only does it address that, but the Psalms also address our relationship with Him. Let me give you some examples of how they address both God and our relationship with Him. In Romans 8, or not Romans 8, I'm sorry, Psalm 8, verses 3 through 4, when I look to the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? And so you have God in the heavens, and the man cannot imagine him coming down, and yet he realizes this great, almighty, omnipotent God is being attentive to him and to the son of man. And so all of a sudden you see the great God, and you see his relationship to them. And what's amazing about the Psalms is the way in which it speaks to us because it uses poetic form to, to emphasize certain things, vivid pictures that are universal in character to talk about our relationship with Him. Consider, for example, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Think about this for a moment. You see, he's thinking about the Lord, and he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And everybody understands. We have this picturesque view of a shepherd caring for the sheep. How many pictures have you seen a shepherd carrying a lamb or watching over the lambs? And so there's this universal view. The Lord is my shepherd. And not only do we understand it, but perhaps nowhere all the rest of the world who does any kind of hurting understands what a shepherd is. And so God reveals himself and his relationship to us in ways that we can understand universally and ways in which speak to our heart. How about Psalm 68, 5, the wonderful verses? Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. And so we see God not only as a shepherd, we see him as a father as well. And so the point is that they reveal God's nature and character, and they reveal our relationship to him. Uh, and yet, so often today, people are confused when it comes to knowing God, 
Even though the Psalms reveals it, people are confused. They think they know God, but there, there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. For example, I know the President of the United States. His name's Joe Biden. No problem. I understand who the president is. I know who the president is. You know, never met him, but I know who he is. I know the president. But I really don't know him, do I? You understand what I'm saying here? Is when we talk about knowing God, there is a personal connection, a personal tie through his son, the Lord Jesus. And so when we looked at the Psalms and we hear, Father of the fatherless, or the Lord is my shepherd. We recognize that he is our shepherd because I am related to him. I am the sheep of his pasture. And you go on and read Psalm 23 and you read those wonderful words uh, that the Lord has for us. But this morning, I want to look at Psalm 19 because I think it gives us some idea about what it means to know God. Psalm 19 was written by David, a man who knew God. Think about this for a minute. David knew God intimately. He knew God's sovereignty because he had taken David, a shepherd boy, and made him king over all of Israel. And we still read about David throughout the New Testament because of the lineage of Christ. He knew God's justice. If you remember, David fell into that sin of adultery and murder, and God confronted him through the prophet Nathan, and he, he repented, and he understood the discipline because the child that he had, the illegitimate child that he had, uh, God had taken that child home. He understood God's sovereignty. He understood God's justice. He under, understood God's mercy and forgiveness. After David was confronted, if you were to go to Psalm 51, there he confesses his sin and says, I was born in iniquity, and he, he stands before the Lord, and he says, don't remove your spirit from me. But many of us don't realize that also in Psalm 32, he addresses this issue. And as he's thinking about his sin, and as he's thinking about the Lord, listen to the way in which he opens Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And so you can see here that David experienced all these things. And so he's writing about knowing God in Psalm 19. A true knowledge of God is not like we simply know the President of the United States, but it is an intimate knowledge. It is a relationship that continues from the time we become as children, when we trust in Christ as our Savior, uh, throughout the rest of our lifetime and into eternity. And the true knowledge of God is one that we experience. It's a transformation of our life. And whenever you see someone getting to know God for the first time throughout Scripture, there is a change that takes place. You remember Zacchaeus, that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, and he wanted to see the Lord, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. I'm not going to sing it for you. I wouldn't do that to you. But you understand what I'm saying. And so what happens? Jesus comes up to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus says, come down, Zacchaeus. Come on down. I'm coming to your house today. And Jesus goes and spends time, and he gets to know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does he do? He returns fourfold all the money that he has stolen over the years in his life as a tax collector. Or think about the Apostle Paul, just breathing fire, so to speak, out to persecute Christians and going to other cities and persecuting Christians. And in, in Acts chapter 9, God confronts him. Jesus confronts him and he blinds him. And at that point, Saul, the Paul, both the same name, came and came to know the Lord Jesus after that. And he talks about it again in Acts 22. He talks about it again in Acts 26. And then when he's writing his friend Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy, he begins to talk about how God had turned his life around. And God said he is an example of what God can do in a life. And immediately, as soon as he's done sharing his testimony, he burst into praise. And so when we talk about knowing God, it is not simply knowing the facts about God. It's not simply knowing of God. It's not simply knowing about God. But rather, when we as believers come and we come before the Lord through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know him. And Psalm 19 gives at least three characteristics of those who know God. And the first one's found in the first six verses. Follow along as I read. We'll be in Psalm 19, verse 1 here. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, 
which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chambers, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. It is rising in its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And the first thing we know is this. Those who know God see him in all things. They see him in all things, in all the things that are around him. This is called in Scripture what theologians call general revelation. It is the idea that God reveals himself through creation. He reveals his power and his glory through nature. And we'll read a verse about that in a moment. He reveals his glory and his power in the sense that we all have a conscience. It doesn't matter where you travel in the world. There, will, there are people who know what is right and what is wrong. Where does that come from? C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, Mere Christianity, talks about this. He calls it the sense of ought. That people have this idea, I ought not to do this. There's something I should do. There's something I should not do. This sense of right and wrong, that comes from the Lord. And then he also reveals himself through the good gifts. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 45, it talks about the fact that it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous, and he gives crops to the righteous and the unrighteous as well. And the purpose of this revelation is to make men and women aware of God's existence. God has formed all of creation to show his glory. For example, let me read to you Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, because that's what it tells us there in that passage of Scripture. It says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. He goes on to say, For the invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that has been made. And it doesn't end there. Listen to what it says at the end of that verse. So they are without excuse. They are without excuse. It's amazing. They cannot, people can deny God if they want to. But when they stand before the Lord and that person says, I never knew God existed. And God says, yes, you did. Did you breathe the air? Did you feel the sunshine on your face? Did you enjoy a cool drink of water? Do you understand that God's all of creation was there to say, God, this is, I am God, I am glorious, I am powerful, I have created this, and I've revealed my nature and my character through this so that when you stand before me, you have no excuse. That is a powerful passage of Scripture, a powerful text. I like the way a poet put it. He puts it this way. There's a poem that he wrote about these verses, and this is what he says. God made the skies with voices clear and gives you eyes so that you can hear. What is he saying there? It's the idea. Let me read it to you again. God made the skies with voices clear and gives you eyes so that you may hear. And so what he's saying is that, that God is revealing himself. All that the psalmist heard, all that the psalmist smelled, all the psalmist tasted, all the psalmist touched and uh, touched all of the psalmist saw all of creation is God revealing that's what he's saying here and those who know God see God in all things because when they see nature they see God at work you know we look we'll sit outside and look for shooting stars we'll take a walk on the beach uh, we'll sit there and watch and for an hour or two to watch the sunset and if you're really ambitious, you get up early enough to watch the sun rise. And we see, why do we do that? Because we're just so amazed of the, of the beauty of the sunrise and the beauty of the sunset. And all of that is the fact that God is revealing his power and his glory. He causes the sun to rise, and we know the, ro the earth rotates and all that, but he causes it. He's the one that's doing this. And every time you see a sunrise, it's God's glory. Every time you see a beautiful sunset, God's glory. You go look at the Grand Canyon, it is God's glory. All of this revealing himself. He, we, we look at the shooting stars and we walk on the beach and we see all these things and God is revealing himself and he's speaking to us. He is speaking to us. And what's remarkable about all of this is that David made these observations through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, but he made these observations without the technology we have today. And the more technology develops, the more glorious God becomes. I remember being in, uh, in I don't know, seventh, eighth grade, and we took a drop of clear pond water. 
and we put it on a slide, and we slipped down into the microscope, and it was just full of these little things swimming around. Now, he didn't have a microscope, but yet, see how much more glorious it is? We look at the pond and say, oh, isn't it peaceful? Look at the lilies, look at the frogs, look at the, and it's, oh, it's so beautiful. And then you look even deeper, and it's even more magnificent. And the deeper you dive into understanding nature and the way in which God's creation works, I mean, I'm amazed. Sometimes read about the bees, what they do, the honeybees, it's amazing. But when you look at this, you understand that in every one of these unique acts, in every one of these displays of power and glory, does God say, I am the Lord. This is from me. Technology makes it more wondrous. More wondrous. And so, but here is the difference. The difference, one who knows God and has a transformed life sees and worships the Creator. They're not worshiping the creation. We're not saying, oh, Mother Earth, or anything, but rather we're saying, this is God displaying His glory. This is God working in the world. This is God preserving and giving us rain and sunshine and crops and tomatoes and all of those things. Not so for those who do not know God. In fact, the opposite response. They come up with these ideas to try to deny the fact that there is a powerful God who has created all of this. All you have to do is pick up any book that's going to follow along with the theory of evolution. They're going to talk about, well, that's, you know, this because of this and because of this and because of this. It is all them trying to escape the reality. And when they stand before God, do you remember what I read to you earlier? They are going to be without excuse. God's going to say to those people who deny him, you have researched my creation. You have seen the amazing things that I do. You have seen how I've organized the earth and have done this and have done this and done this, and you still deny me. You have no excuse. Oh, but for us as believers, as us as believers, it is far greater. And that is because we have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who truly knew, knew, know God see God in his glory in all things. And when we think about this, it is a glory that is being displayed in nature that make all men and women accountable. He reveals himself so clearly that every person who exists is accountable. And you say, well, what about the person that's born blind and they can't see things? They can taste things. They can feel things. They can smell things. You see, it, it doesn't, require all of our senses working at one time to see creation. And God has designed it so that there is no one that's able to stand before him. The blind person can't say, I never felt the sunshine on my face, or I never heard the birds sing, or whatever it might be, because we always have the other senses that reveal God. And God reveals himself so clearly that they're accountable and without excuse. And no one, as I said to you earlier, can claim that God never told me. To deny God's revelation is to deny the reality of the way things are. It's not only a glory that makes men and women accountable, as I read to you in Romans chapter 1. It is also a glory that we all receive visually and universally. Every person has a sense, as I mentioned to you earlier. We have taste, we feel, we smell, we see. We may not have all of them, and some of them may not be as strong as others if we lose our hearing or whatever it might be, but yet we still have these senses. And all the, and the, the sense of taste, the sense of smell, the sense of feeling or touching, the sense of sight, all of those things are gifts from God so that we might understand His creation. You see, God has just kind of poured himself, revealing himself to us through all the things that are around us. And he's created us so that we might respond to them in the appropriate way. A glory that not only we receive universally, but it's a glory that surpasses language. Uh, did you notice what it says in verse 3? Look at it carefully. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. You don't have to be able to speak several languages. You don't have to have super knowledge. You don't have to be the most intelligent person in the world. You could be from anywhere. But you see, God has designed creation and revealed himself to us so much so that no one is without excuse, that no one can stand before him and say, I do not know. Uh, and Again, he has done so in a way that it is universal. Not a word is spoken in God's revelation through nature, but volumes, volumes are being spoken. 
It is a glory that brings joy to the soul. Did you notice some of these examples he gives? He says something, he talks about it and says, it's like a bridegroom coming forth. And you think, what in the world is he talking about there? A bridegroom coming forth. Well, I don't want to disappoint you ladies, but back in antiquity, the bride was pfft, nothing. It was all about the man. Do you remember even in the New Testament in Matthew, right? The ten virgins with the lamps. What were they waiting for? They're waiting for the bridegroom to come. He was the man. He was the man of the hour, you know? It's not that way today. It's almost like completely reversed, and it's not a biblical way of talking about the, the bridegroom and the bride. You understand there's nothing wrong with that. But the point I'm making is, imagine how everyone wants to see the bride, what she's wearing, what her veil looks like, what jewelry she have on, how beautiful will she be when she comes in, and you're all anticipating, you're all waiting. And he is saying that about the bridegroom, which was the same thing in antiquity, and that's what he's saying. He's talking about, it is surpasses language, but it's a glory that brings, that brings joy to the soul. He said, here's the bride, yay! That's what he's talking about. He goes on and says, it's like a strong man that runs a course. He says, we're so good to see. And, 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 and he's talking here about his own personal feelings. He's all joyous about the bridegroom coming in. But then he says, it's like a strong man that runs the race. And the only thing I can say that can bear it to today is the idea that we're in the zone. We talk about that expression. Everything just works perfect and follows along in sports, and they're in the zone. That's what he's saying. He said, when I look at it, God's creation, I, I am in the zone. And then he uses the sun and says, nothing is hidden from its heat. And so you get this idea that, that God is just pounding away and revealing himself, revealing himself, revealing himself. And there's no escape from God's revealing. And what kind of transformation does this knowledge bring? I remember the first time going over this text of Scripture, and I, and I was just like set back from how wonderful it was that God revealed himself so much. But then I began to think that, you know, it's not only in these big sunsets, but it's in every aspect of God's created world that he reveals himself. You know, uh, I, we have a garden in our, in our yard, and I just can't wait for the tomato plants to come in. You know, I, I put up all year long with those hothouse tomatoes, and then finally the garden comes. And uh, I got this thing where I want to be the first one to pick the first tomato, whether it be a little cherry tomato or a regular tomato. But I want to be the first one. And that didn't even make it to the house, from the backyard to the house. It's right on in. You know, what is that? Or I'm looking at the bird feeder, and here's this beautiful golden finch, all gold with black wings. Uh, you know, or we have hummingbirds out of our area too. We've got a hummingbird feeder. We watch the hummingbirds, and now they're getting, we have one on the window. It gets real close to the window, and I, there are times you can even see it sticking his tongue into the, into the sugar water, trying to get the sugar water. And, and I look at those things, and you say, man, they're so cool. But they're beyond cool, because what they're doing is saying, it's me, Al. It's me that made the colors on that golden finch. It's me that makes that Jersey tomato so tasty. It is me who created this little tiny bird that flies to Central America every year, all the way from the state of New Jersey, which is amazing, and he flies there. This is me. This is me revealing my power and my glory. And it's like all of this around me, God is speaking to me. It's going to happen again this year as you drive down certain roads and all the leaves are turning color. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, what is, is God saying? I don't talk to you. See my glory in this. See my glory in the golden finch, in the fresh tomatoes, in whatever it might be. But you understand that it's not only things that bring about wonder that reveal God, it is, and which they do, but as believers knowing that God is revealing himself in the beauty and the wonder of all of, created, all of creation, he's speaking to us. He is speaking to us. I mean, think about this for a moment. Do you see God in all things? You know, if I said, do you see God in flowers? And say, oh, yeah, so beautiful. You know, I just love those flowers. Do you see God in weeds? <laughs> when was the last time you picked a weed out of your garden or out of your front yard or tried to get that grass out of the crack in your, in your driveway? And you see, stupid weeds. <laughs> I don't want to make you feel guilty or anything, but it's kind of tough to complain about it once you know that God is revealing us, revealing his glory through the weeds as well. He does that. Or, you know, when we, we, we think of snow 
and you know, the first snow of the year, it's always exciting. After that, you say, okay, we've had enough snow. I don't want to shovel anymore. But we look at the snow. We say, oh, isn't it beautiful? Look at the snow. I love it when it clings to the trees and all the branches are covered. And it's so beautiful. And then you've got to deal with the slush. Slush is part of God's creation. It's the way he w- made the world. It, it, it was a slow-melting snow. Seeps into the ground better. Or how about the crops? You know, we love, you drive down and you see these crops of corn or tomato fields or eggplant fields or whatever kind of field it might be. You see God just blessing us with all of this food and all this kind of thing. But then again, if you ever go down South Jersey about the springtime and take a ride down through the fields there, you're going to have an eye-opening experience. In fact, your eyes may even burn uh, as they spread out the fertilizer. They make this stuff slurry. I want to tell you, it'll clean your sinuses out in a minute. That's how it is like. But you see, even that's part of God's creation. It's made from the manure. And, and, you know, the cows eat the grass, they have manure, they put it back on the grass, they put it back on the food. You see, all of this, all of this, all of this reveals God's glory. It is God's design. God says, I want my creation to know me, so I've given them all of this creation, all of this glory. And God's hand is in all things. And the psalmist knows the creator. And those who know God see him in all things. And the greatest most wonderful part about this thought that those who know God know, those who know God see Him in all things is that when we begin to look around and see nature around us, that God is doing it for us. When you look out at that sunset, you say, God's speaking to me. He's telling me how wonderful He is. God's talking to me as I'm enjoying that juicy steak or if you're a vegetarian, that great salad. God understands He's he, he given us the ability to understand these things, that we might know him all for our benefit and for his glory, most importantly, his glory. And then the second thing I want is verses 7 through 11. Now, I want you to notice something in your Bibles about this. I want you to notice what he says here. Um, he is going to talk about the law of God. He's going to talk about the word of God. And as he's talking about it, it's a, it's a way in which Hebrew poetry works. And I'll show you as we read through it. But take a look with me, if you will, at 19, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. There's a statement. Why? And you could say this. Why is the law of the Lord perfect? Notice what it says. Reviving the soul. It says the testimony of the Lord is sure. Well, why is the testimony of the Lord sure? He's making wise the simple. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right. Why? It rejoices the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Why? It enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Why? Because it enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so you see he is now talking about the word of God. Six descriptions, six ways in answering the question. It's a literary device is what he's putting into play here. And the benefits come from obedience. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And I want you (coughs) to see that when he's talking about the Word of God and we talk about the Word of God and Scripture, he is not simply talking about a piece of literature. Scripture is not like any other book in the world. It is uniquely given to us by God. It is uniquely given to us and given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of God's word is God breathed, the way 1 Timothy puts it. And I want you to notice, uh, 1 or 2 Timothy puts it, but I want you to notice what it says about the word of God. He listed here, but Hebrews, the author of Hebrews puts it another way. He says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There is nothing in the world like the Word of God because it begins, it's living, it works in our heart. It is something that is uh, active. Have you ever read the Word of God and all of a sudden you've just felt, oh man, I can't believe that. I mean, sometime, sometime read James chapter 3, and it talks about the dangers of the tongue. And if you can read that without getting through thinking of some time you lost your temper or you said something you shouldn't have, and you read that passage and you're ready to confess. Why is that? Because that speaks to our heart. It is something that speaks to our heart. It just gets a hold of us and grabs a hold of us. That's the word of God. 
And the psalmist not only knows God's word, he understands it. He thinks about it. Think about how he's describing it. He says laws, testimonies, precepts, commandments, all different synonyms using to describe the word of God so we might get the full picture. And not only does he know the word of God, he recognizes that the word of God, the word of God reveals God's character. I mean, think about how he described the word of God. Perfect. Sure. Right, pure, clean, true. All of these things are God's character and many, many other things. I mean, consider the power of God in the life of those who know him. Notice what he says here. I just want to go through this for a few minutes. Um, it says this, the law of the Lord is perfect. Complete, and the idea of being perfect is, is complete without flaw. It's sufficient. It's not defeated in any way. God's word is perfect. We don't always want to think that way. We want to think, well, you know, maybe this, we read the word of God and we're not so sure we like what it says and we start looking for a different interpretation and we can't find one to to fit our opinion and so we begin to look around. But no, God's word is perfect. Doesn't have err in it. Um, Reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew 4, 4. Man does not live by bread alone, but what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's the living word. It revives the soul. It gives us joy, the whole person. Knowing God through his perfect word gives us life. I mean, think about Psalm 119, verse 93, when he says this. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. In fact, Psalm, all of Psalm 119 is about the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing through what? The word of God. You see how important it is to the psalmist. And those who know God know his word. And those who know God's word know God. You see, it's just a continual cycle. When we go to the word of God, we're learning about God, who he is, his character, and his nature. He goes on to say the testimonies of the Lord is sure. And the idea is that the word of God can be trusted. God can be trusted. Uh, not you know, knowing what God has done. He makes wise the simple. I'm reminded of Psalm 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but, it's purpo- but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Um, God, God's word is, is always right. And we're going to at times, when we read the word of God and we become convicted over sin or something of that nature, we're going to know God is speaking to me here. He's speaking to me. I need to apologize to this person. I need to do this. I need to do that. Because God's word is living and active and is speaking to me and is transforming me. And the more obedient I am to the word of God, the more I'm conformed to the image of his son, the more glory I'm giving to God. That is the idea. That is the idea. The precepts of the Lord are right. God is never wrong. In fact, he says it rejoices the heart. There is stability in reading the word of God that we have. The commandment of the Lord is pure or radiant and expresses the fact that God's word gives us light to make vision possible. As I was, when I I taught Baptist High for about seven years, uh, high school Bible, and and one of the things I learned is how how the Lord makes things clear through his word. Uh, He gives it to us, it's pure, it, it expresses, he gives us light. And so one of the challenges I would have sometimes in just trying to keep the kids' attention, I say, name one topic. And I would try, they would name a topic. They would say, uh, I don't know, the ocean. And I'd say, okay, so how many verses do we have about the ocean? You understand, God's word covers everything. In fact, First Peter tells us that God's word gives us all that we need. God has given us all that we need for godliness and this life that we have as well. And God's word is just being promoted here. And he's saying, those who know God, know his word, know it. And we know that it will never pass away that it endures forever. Matthew 24, 25 puts it this way. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. He goes on to say the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's word is always right. If you were ever to look at the book of 1 Corinthians, you know in the beginning of part of 1 Corinthians that they're having problems. There were people that were saying this, I follow the apostle Paul. Oh, well, I follow Apollos. And others say, well, me, 
I follow Peter. And then you had the real super spiritual ones that would say, well, I follow Jesus. I don't know how you can argue with that, but that's what was going on. You had these divisions within the church. And so he writes to them and begins to talk to them about the idea of God's wisdom. That God's wisdom is foolishness to the world. That God's wisdom is far different than what those who do not know God think about. And so then, from that point on, he starts giving them some really hard rules. He says, church, he says, discipline that guy that married his stepmother. Stop treating communion like it's a common meal. It is God's table, and you act that way in, in chapter 11. What do you mean you doubt the resurrection? Jesus resurrected in 15. And so he says, here is God's wisdom. And then he goes on and says, this is what God's wisdom says about this topic and this sin and this sin. You see, God's word transforms us, but he goes on and talks about how important it is because it is always right. Even when we think it's not going to work out, Lord, you don't understand. Yes, he does understand. He's given us his word to follow. Those who know God value his word. And in fact, he gives us two metaphors about how valuable God's word is. And the first one is this. He says that God's word is, much, is like is like gold and then he wants to make it clear much fine gold you see he just piles that right on top there god's words not only as valuable as gold but it's as valuable as much fine gold and he says it's not only sweet but it's sweeter than the sweetest thing they know and then that was and that was honey at the time the benefit of knowing god's word is more valuable than anything money can buy it is anything it gives us a way in which we are able to live and the sad part is this. When I began thinking about the, the, the Word of God, and I think about the accessibility. Now, some of you will understand this. Some of you are too young to remember. But whenever you used to study, when I was in Bible college and even in seminary, if you were going to study a passage of Scripture and particular words, you had to get out a, a book called Strong's Concordance. The thing, you needed a tractor to lift it. I mean, it's... And, you know, it's bad enough that it's so big and heavy but when you open it, you need a magnifying glass to read it. And so you'd say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do a study on love. What does the Bible say about love? And so you open it up, and you've got this microscopic writing, all this whole long list of columns, what it says about love. Now today, if I want to look up a word, I go to my word program, and I just type in the biblical word in the program, and not only does it give me it right there, but it also writes out the whole verse much more accessible. If you wanted to hear a sermon back when I was in college, you, get, you would get a, a tape, you, the cassette tapes, those little square ones. Yeah, I don't even know if they still, they're still making them. But you understand what I'm saying is that the idea is that technology can be a bad thing, but it be a good thing because now we have more access, accessibility to the Word of God than we have ever had, and yet it seems as though believers, those who know God, seem to be more and more illiterate biblically about that. And we have it all right there. We put the Bibles on our phones. We have sayings uh, on so We can listen to sermons, all these wonderful things that God has given to us. And yet, sadly, we don't always take advantage of them. But God's Word, those who know God know His Word. And when we begin to think about God's Word, it is more than information. What it makes it valuable is the fact that it expresses God's love for us. When Kathy and I went to high school together, and that's when we started dating our freshman year in college, Kathy went out to Indiana. I went to New York State to college. And I remember being up at college. It was King's College in Briarcliff Manor, New York. And I was up there in college. And, and I can remember, you know, back then, you didn't have email, instant message, phones, any of that kind of thing. You just wrote letters. And if you wanted to call, you had to make all kinds of arrangements. When are you going to be by the public phone? And you would stack up your quarters, ready to put them in. Particularly, a call to Indiana. It cost like five, ten dollars at the time. So that was a lot of money then. So... You know, but what we would do is we would write letters back and forth. And I knew the mail came around 1 or 2 o'clock every day at the college. And so in the morning, I'd go up to the meal hall and get breakfast. You know what I would do? I'd check the mail. I knew it wasn't coming to 1 o'clock, but I would check the mail. After my first class, oh, I, I could stop by, see if there's any mail. No. Oh, I step by again, see if there's any mail. And I would like... All I could do, I wanted to get the letter. I wanted to see the letter. I wanted to see the letter. You know, and it, it wasn't like these letters were great love poems or anything. It was like, well, it rained a lot today. It's pretty chilly out here in Indiana. 
Do you think I cared? No, I didn't care. Why? Because Kathy was writing to me. He, she was expressing herself to me. And when we did that and sharing the letters, it was an expression of love. I got to know her even better than I knew her when I was in high school. And not only that, there was a growing intimacy that took place. Now, if that's true on a human level, think what it's like when we read the Word of God. God's saying, I love you, Al, and here's my word. I'm speaking to you. I want you to understand me. I want you to know me. I'm showing myself to you, and I'm showing you things that are sweeter than honey. I'm showing you things that are more valuable than gold. I'm showing you that I love you. All the true more. So God loves us and has given us his word to revive the soul to give us wisdom, to give us joyful hearts, to enlighten us, to build the intimacy that we have with Him. God says, I, I want to talk to you. Go to the Word of God. I want to talk to Him. I go to prayer. You see, the, these are the kinds of things that, that God is just so good and gracious in giving us. And those who know God know the sweetness of His Word. Those who know God know the righteousness of His Word. Those who know God know the power of God's Word, how it transforms the life because God's Word transformed my life. So because someone told me the Word of God, I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and I am His child. So we see that those who know God see Him in all things. Those who know God value His Word. There's just one more thing, and I'll be very quick with this. Those who know God desire to please Him. Look at verses 12 through 14 with me. Who can discern His errors? Declare me innocent from the hidden faults. Keep back your servant from the presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see what he is saying here. He talks about his hidden faults, and they're the sins that he does that he's unaware of. He doesn't understand why he does these things. He doesn't quite get it. For example, you might say to yourself, why did I talk to that person in such a way? Well, something just got a hold of me, and I just blurted it out, and it was wrong. You know, they're the hidden sins. They're the things that just creep up on us and grab us all of a sudden. Um, you know, it, 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 why did I do that? And then he goes on and he says, keep me from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins are winful, uh, willful sins. You know, th those sins that presume that we know better than God or a defiance of his word, uh, an intentional sin. And you say, well, man, I'm okay with that one. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But is there anyone here who has ever not said something like this? I know I should, but. What is that? What is that? You know, e even as a pastor, someone will say to me, well, no, pastor, I've been out of church for quite a while, and I know I should be there, but. See, as soon as you say that but, you're saying, God's word says I need to be there, but I don't want to. And, so I'm, that, and then we you know, give three pages of excuses as to why we don't. But you understand what I'm saying. That's a presumptuous sin. And the psalmist who knows God, he knows the sweetness of his word. He knows how God loves him and revealed himself to him. He says, Lord, keep me from that. Keep me from the presumptuous sins. Keep me from those things that, that, that I don't want to do. And then you go on and the psalmist goes to God and he, and he, he has a word of prayer. He says, he says this, verse 14. He says, let the words of my mouth, our actions, what we say, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, my attitudes. Let those two things, my actions and my attitudes, let those, those things be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so his knowledge of God grows. He first recognizes that God is revealing himself to him in such a marvelous way through creation. And then he realizes that God is speaking to him and working in his heart through his word. And as he comes before God, he says, Lord, let the, meditation, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You see, those who know God see him in all things. Those who know God value his word. Those who know God desire to please him. I trust that that would be our knowledge of the Lord. It may not be perfect and it never will be in this age, but let me tell you, if you know the Lord, you see him in everything. If you know the Lord, you're going to have his word work in your heart. 
if you know the Lord, your desire is that I'm going to honor him with my life because he saved my soul through his son. Let's pray together. Father, we are just so thankful for your word. Lord, we are overwhelmed. How much in just a few verses you have shared with us that you have opened our eyes to your word. And I ask, Lord, that my heart would be sensitive to your word. I'd be careful what I say. That I'd be knowledgeable of your word. That, Lord, when I leave and I enjoy the wonderful gifts of your creation and I see your beauty in the things that bring wonder, that I would praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.